Check out this mic. I feel like Joyce Myers. <laughs> but she doesn't have all these beautiful wrinkles. <laughs> I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I struggle with low self-esteem, anger, drug addiction, and codependency. And my name is Sue. These lights are bright. Whew. Like that? Okay. All right. The first night I came to CR, I started serving on the barbecue team. After that, I had a reason to keep coming back. And not one person ever told me I needed to be clean and sober or that I needed to join the church or needed to be coming for six months or a year before I was able to serve. I was accepted just like I was. Right away, this was my home, my safe place to find healing. For those of you new tonight, I hope and pray that this is true for you also. I remember my early childhood as a simple life, full of love, lots of family and chores. We always had a lot of cousins around to play with, and holidays were filled with lots of love, food, and family. But sometimes, when the adults weren't around, my older cousin would molest us younger girls. I was only five or six. I didn't realize the effect that it would have on the rest of my life. Satan had opened the door to perversion, causing extreme feelings of isolation, low self-esteem, and I began to self-gratify at five. At 15, I married my childhood sweetheart who had just returned home from Vietnam. I found out that he was not the same sweet, dark-eyed boy that I thought I loved. He had become very controlling and abusive, and our marriage only lasted a few months. Soon I was alone, barely 16, and pregnant. At 16 and a half, I had my first daughter. I lied and said I was older and that I had waitress experience to get my first job to support us. When I was 17, I tried pot, and it didn't take long until I was putting a needle in my arm. The first time I tried speed, I went to juvenile detention. The second time, I went to jail. You'd think that would have stopped me, but it didn't because I loved the way it made me feel. Since I had a child and wanted to get away from the drugs, I accepted an offer from a friend to get away from Sepulpa and make a lot of money. Today it saddens me to admit I was selling my body to complete strangers. I was managing a private upscale club by Turner Falls where I had a couple more girls working with me. We had illegal gambling, booze, and men could buy about anything for a price. After we had a visit from three state and federal law enforcement agencies, I ran back to Sepulpa. I met my second husband in 1971. We were young, wild, and passionate. He hated junkies, so I had no problem staying away from the speed. He had a lot of anger and aggression, and we had a very volatile relationship. He discovered pot helped him not be so aggressive. So smoking pot and drinking was an everyday way of life. Our first daughter was born in 1975. Shannon was his pride and joy. He no longer had any use for my daughter, Pam, and began to ignore her completely, causing a lot of hard feelings. Understandably, she became very rebellious at an early age. He fathered another child, a daughter, by another woman in 1977, who has become a daughter and a joy to me. I took her in at age 13. We had another daughter in 1984. By this time, my oldest daughter was using drugs and I was struggling to maintain a home life and desperately trying to hold my family together. I always had to work because I never knew when he would get mad and leave us to fend for ourselves. When our youngest was three, my husband started importing marijuana from Belize in Mexico. He soon got more involved, making more and more trips. I didn't mind having suitcases of pot under our bed, but when it became kilos of pure rock cocaine, I made him leave the house for good, and we divorced. Soon he was arrested and was sent to prison, forcing me to work a split shift at a restaurant and club in Tulsa. 
My middle daughter, Shannon, was now completing seventh grade. She was a cheerleader. She was in band. She was in dance school. She completed Miss Preteen Pageants. When I moved us to Tulsa, she hated me for it. She quit school in the eighth grade, started running the streets, and became pregnant at 15. Talk about following in her mama's footsteps. In 1988, it had been 17 years since I used meth, but I ran into some old friends that were doing meth, and I joined them. It made me feel like Superwoman. Although I prayed and tried to put up a good front, my life was so miserable. I got involved with a younger man that I worked with in the past. I was struggling to keep the bills paid, was taking my girls to see their dad in prison, volunteering at my youngest daughter's kindergarten. My life and drug use was out of control. I started having a lot of pain and found out that I was pregnant. The doctor told me that I would have to have an abortion because of uterine cyst. I really didn't want another child. And I truly thought I was having a tubal pregnancy. But when I saw that little heartbeat in my uterus, I realized that I was killing my child by moving forward with abortion. A year later, I became pregnant by the same man. I hit my knees. And God told me he would take care of me if I would trust him. I gave birth to a healthy nine-pound baby boy. I stayed clean for a few months until an old friend paid a debt with a gram of cocaine. I didn't like coke, but I did it anyway. Satan had put just the right temptation in my hands, and I didn't have the tools from CR that I needed to withstand the temptation. I started selling meth so I could stay home and raise my kid, and then married my, fa my son's father. This was my third husband, but by this time, he had lost a lot of respect and trust for me. He had also started using, and we divorced two years later. My children have suffered from my addiction. They dealt with my crazy lifestyle and fits of pure anger when life got overwhelming. This chaotic lifestyle rolled along, and soon my son was becoming a teenager. My daughters were all caught up in their own addictions. I tried to convince him that I had beaten addiction. Matthew, my son, was starting to experiment with pot and alcohol. Some of his friends were overdosing on pills. I remember I would stand at his bedroom door and tell him how dangerous drugs were and that he should stay away from them. Then I would lock myself in my room and I would get high. I was saved as a young girl and even baptized. I always believed that there was, there is a loving, merciful God. I would attend church here and there. In 2000, I started attending church regularly. Before long, I was serving in the children's church, in the kitchen, doing set up for events. I even served on the visiting prayer team. I was trying so hard to be a good servant and all the while I was still fighting addiction. I wanted so much to have the peace and joy that I could see in others. The harder I tried, the more unmanageable my life became. I was doing everything on my own power. Today I can see I was realizing the, prince, the truth of principle one, realize I'm not God. I admit that I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. In 2003, I was able to turn over a 39-year cigarette habit to God. He totally delivery, delivered me from smoking just as if I'd never smoked. I believe he would have taken my meth habit, but I chose to keep it. Notice, I claimed it as mine. After all, I wasn't hurting anybody. Those next few years, I lived in spiritual torment, refusing to fully submit to God's plan for my life. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can slave for two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will stick to the one and despise the other. You cannot slave for God and for riches. I lived a lie. Everything about me was a lie. In 2005, I got a job at a prestigious country club. 
that one right down the street. Again, living that lie. I knew they were starting drug testing at my job. I had quit attending my church, and my addiction had got totally out of hand. You see, my dealer lived next door. I absolutely could not go out my front door and get in my car and leave for work without sneaking next door. Then I would sneak around to the back of my house, go in my back door, and get high before I left. I absolutely could not go from my front door to my car. That's how addicted I was. I would sit at my desk and look at myself in the mirror and say, I hate you. I hate you for being so weak. Then the day came I arrived at work and there was the note. Please report downstairs for random drug testing. I was so embarrassed. I immediately cleaned out my locker, clocked out and left without saying a word to anyone. My whole life, my world stopped. All the denial and all the lies had caught up to me. I was overwhelmed with guilt and shame. I went to a friend, got a half gram of crystal meth and did it all. It was one of those neck-wrenching, jaw-popping highs. My son took one look at me that evening and said, Mom, what is wrong with you? That was my rock bottom. My brother was now clean and attending church at Restoring Life's program and Celebrate Recovery at Southern Hills Baptist Church. He kept asking me to come. He had put a simple prayer on his voicemail that said, Lord, I pray for this person that is calling right now that they would come to a more personal and profound relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I began to beg Jesus for just that. I cried out to the Lord and asked him, why didn't he take this addiction from me? He spoke to my spirit that night. He told me that he won't take what I wouldn't give him. He showed me that Jesus shed his precious holy blood on the cross for me. And every time I chose to mix drugs into my bloodstream, it grieved his Holy Spirit. Sunday, March 1st, 2008, I walked into a little Holy Ghost-filled church. The sermon was on 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will clean their land. The Spirit of God was so strong in that place. For the first time, I was able to completely surrender my will to his power. He performed a miracle of total deliverance in me that day. It was a spiritual, physical, and mental cleansing. I can only describe it as a complete purging. I had been so bound by the demonic forces of meth, anger, insecurity, and inferiority that it kept me bound my entire life. My brother also began taking me to celebrate recovery right here at Southern Hills Baptist. He was serving on the barbecue team and he introduced me to the team leader who asked me if I would like to join her team. I felt loved and accepted from the time I walked in and everyone kept telling me to keep coming back. The first time I sat in small group and I was able to say, I'm a believer in Christ who struggles with meth addiction it was like the weight of the world was taken off my shoulders. I didn't have to live that lie anymore. I was living out principle one of Celebrate Recovery. I realized that I was not God. I was finally in a place where I was free to admit that I was powerless and that my life was unmanageable. And I consciously chose to commit all my life and my will to His control. Immediately, I joined a step study. Being in a step study helped me to be able to make amends with my second husband. He had gotten clean years before. He was very ill and now disabled. And I was so blessed to be his caregiver the last two years of his life and was able to lead him in the sinner's prayer before his death. And we spent a lot of time reading the Bible and praying together. 
I've been totally clean from meth for 12, almost 13 years. <laughs> Amen. In God good. In that time, I've completed at least a dozen step studies, one a year, <laughs> half of which I've helped lead inside the prison walls at Eddie Warrior Correctional Center. <laughs> See our inside, y'all. I have been total. Um, okay. I joined Southern Hills Baptist Church, and I've served as a leader in open share groups, step studies, and on the Celebrate Recovery Inside team, and the Celebrate Recovery Inside Out team, and the greeter team. Today, I'm able to live out principle eight, which says, yield myself to God to be used to bring this good news to others, both by my example and by my words. Jesus continues to do a work in me as long as I continue to submit to his will for my life. My greatest duty is now raising three of my grandchildren. I always said I wanted to have a big house in the country and raise horses, but God keeps sending me children. <laughs> he helps me every day to learn to walk in the fruits of spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I have trouble with that self-control one. I do not want my testimony to glorify the destruction or the chaos or the darkness. I want my testimony to glorify the resurrection power of God in my life. I want to be able to stand here and testify of the glory of God. I want to declare freedom through Jesus Christ. I want to testify that the Holy Spirit of the living God lives in me. Amen. Amen. With the power of God's Spirit living in me, I can't walk in anger. I can't walk inferior to the world around me. God is teaching me every day to walk in the power of His Holy Spirit and to bear the fruits of his spirit. Four out of five of my children have been caught up in addiction, and their children are paying the price just as they did. I pray to stop that cycle by being a new creation, by being the new creation that God has made me. I'm so grateful for what he's done in my life. I am not who I was. Amen. Thanks to Celebrate Recovery and the true love of Jesus I've received through others he has placed in my life. It's my deepest desire to be the hands and feet of Jesus to everyone he puts in my walk of life. I would like to encourage each of you to never underestimate the power of a simple prayer. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Romans 12, 13 says, When God's children are in need, you may be the one to help them out. It was my brother's invite that helped me. So invite someone to church or celebrate recovery because we all need to feel accepted and loved in the divine healing of Jesus. It is my sincere prayer that my words have reached into your mind and your heart, and I pray that each of us can develop a deeper and more personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for letting me share.